this is Scott Pollock of the Critical Post Chicago, chief editor for uh, SAME, coming to you live or almost live from the capital of the Midwest Coast, Chicago, Illinois, USA. Uh, we have an Las Vegas debacle update or a Las Vegas shooting, mass shooting update. Uh, Paladin's got uh, a few things to add to uh, what's just been released as, is it the final report, Paladin? Yes, it, it's the final report by the LVMPD. The, the uh, FBI still has to release their report, which is, uh, it, nobody knows when. They've, they've indicated finally that it will be by the end of the year. Oh boy, I can't wait for that. Yeah, we're all waited with bated breath. Yeah, trust me. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we, we watch uh, as you. Uh, uh, we might as well tell the audience we watch the communities out there and in on you on YouTube, and we see what people are trying to do. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with trying to get to the facts of the matter. Um, uh, the problem I obviously see with some of them, Paladin, is that some of these people have political invective in mind, uh, and so there's a bias. But uh, let's just get to the uh, meat of the matter uh, on the final report and uh, what your thoughts are and the bullet points you want to carry. Okay, I think Cut. the okay, yeah, and, and I think the main the main issue is the the ballistics or the lack of ballistics, um, and this. This was apparent to me when I did the review of the auto the, the 58 uh, victim autopsies, because whenever you have a gunshot situation, um, there typically the pathologists who do the autopsies recover bullets and bullet fragments. And if the pathologists are worth their salt and they're they're experienced in gunshot wounds, which they should be if they're doing a an autopsy on gunshot wound victims. Uh, they should, at the very least, know what caliber uh, of bullet that they're that they're taking out of the body. And of all the 58 um, of all the 58 autopsies that we reviewed, uh, there were there were uh, bullets or bullet fragments recovered from 46. The other 12 um, were, according to the autopsies, through and through wounds, where the bullet uh, penetrated the body and exited the body. So. Um, Seeing that we didn't get any information whatsoever out of the autopsies, I thought, okay, well, this is the first step in the process, and they've 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 missed the first step. So I didn't expect them to complete the steps that would they would have to take after this. Um, so the final report on that, well, maybe we'll maybe we'll see something in there, and and we didn't. So that that process starts with taking the bullets out of the victims, matching the bullets to the the guns, and of course, we know about all the guns that were um, that were recovered in 134 and 135. So you would make that match forensically, and then you would then, from Paddock's body, since he's um, he was deceased, or they're telling us he was deceased, you would do certain um, chemical tests on his hands, on his cheek, on his face, uh, to detect whether he had fired a weapon, and of course. I know some people are going to say, well, he was wearing gloves, which he was, but they, you can still do chemical tests on the gloves. And we don't see that. We didn't see that uh, indicated in the autopsy. We didn't see that in the final report. So that's what sticks out to me at this point in time. Uh, it's glaring. Uh, so, you know, obviously that's a, a break in the chain of evidence. Yeah, and I think any if Paddock had survived, if Paddock was alive, and they had charged him with with murder, mass murder. Any competent uh, defense attorney probably would be able to get him, get him off, get him acquitted, just simply uh, on that. Because uh, as a private investigator who would be providing litigation support for a defense attorney, that would be something. One of the things I would be charged with. He would he would request the forensics on that, and it, we would review it and. Uh, they would have to present that in court, and that would be exculpatory evidence, if you will, that a defense attorney would be all over. Because if you don't have that, the only thing that you're really left with is the circumstantial evidence, which is Paddock rented the room, Paddock bought the guns, uh, and that's it. So that's all they would have, essentially. Can you explain what the word exculpatory means? 
Yeah, exculpatory is is essentially um, evidence that the police would come across in their investigation that could go against the narrative, which the narrative in this kind of a situation would be that this person uh, is guilty. So in other words, if they came across information that would possibly throw doubt into their case, they are provide they they are they are compelled by law to turn that over uh, to the defense. And a lot of times, the prosecution does not do that, or they'll wait to the very end of a case to do that. And a lot of times, a judge, if he finds out about it, will will call, will basically create call it a mistrial. And that's exactly what happened in the Nevada uh, federal case uh, against the Bundys. There was there was a exculpatory evidence that was uh, withheld from the defense regarding some things that were happening within the BLM, and once that came to light, the judge the judge had to de- declare a mistrial. Okay, so this is um, um, part of the problem with uh, this whole uh, chain chain of evidence. Um, the next question uh, would be, um, uh, of course, they destroyed the evidence, uh, and, and, and this is the most curious of all to me, and that is is that they cremated um, his body. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, I mean, wouldn't any – why uh, – do we know who directed the um, – uh, the cremation to take place. You know, I don't know that. An- I don't know the answer to that. It could be out there. My recollection of what transpired there was that Eric Paddock, his youngest brother, who uh, lives in Florida, was um, was no- was to be notified of when the body was cremated, so they could send the ashes. Well, the um, the coroner, I guess, did the cremation on the body, I believe, December 21st, but never sent the ashes to Eric back in Florida. So Eric finally, I believe in January, had to fly to Vegas to finally get the ashes. Uh, the Las Vegas coroner did that? Yes. Yeah, Clark County. Mm-hmm. So the Las Vegas coroner was, uh, at one point or another, uh, would it be correct to ask the question, uh, was he given direction to do that? Because and, if you're breaking yeah. the sh- I mean, if he was given direction to do that, then there has to be uh, um, foreknowledge of something in order to break the chain of evidence. Yeah, and you know what this this, and I know some people may not want to be want to think about this or hear this, uh, but it it reminds me of the Bin Laden raid where they buried bin laden at at sea yeah so we never got to really confirm that it was really him uh and and of course with paddock you know there's no way that now we can exhume the body to do for any forensics on the body uh and they can't do any gunpowder matches they can't do the uh, the chain of evidence is destroyed right right so the person that ordered the coroner to do the cremation has foreknowledge of something do we know who uh directed the coroner to do a, a cremation no uh, we don't and it, it very well could have been paddock's family i i really don't know um because by the time i finally decided to dive into this 100 percent, most of this had already transpired because as i understand it paddock was uh, Paddock's body was cremated sometime in December. I'm thinking December 21st, but I could be wrong on that. But it was done sometime in December. Eric Paddock had indicated that, you know, uh, the coroner was supposed to send him the ashes. The coroner never did send the ashes. So Eric had to make a trip to Las Vegas to pick up the ashes. And he kind of made a stink about that. So uh, whether it was directed or not from the family, I really don't know. Um, I think in normal circumstances, you would have the body shipped to Florida and they would do the cremation. 
Uh, so I don't know, you know, if the, if the coroner does a cremation, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with that process, but you know, it, you get, somebody has to pay for that cremation. <laughs> you know, somebody has got to foot that bill right. and it's, it seems like in normal cases or in all cases, it would be the responsibility of the family to right. foot that bill. Right. So I don't know if the coroner did it of his own volition, sent him, sent him a bill. Mm. I, I don't know. But in a normal circumstance, you would ship the body back to Florida, or if that's where they wanted it, and then the body would ha- the the family would handle the cremation. But the so, but, but my, my I have may I uh, interject here and say I have a problem with this whole this whole thought process uh, uh, performed by them, because if they were interested in actually getting to the bottom of this. Um, after seeing the public outrage, I mean, they they must have known that there was public outrage about this. So they were aware that a lot of people were paying attention to this, uh, especially online. And um, they decided, somebody decided, no, it's okay uh, to uh, uh, destroy the evidence. Uh, in this case, because this is who did it, this is our this is our summation, and that's it. Somebody made a decision to make that final because they had no interest in going any further than that. Well, and and you know this, and that's an excellent point. And and what I've said from the beginning: see, once you have a dead suspect, then you're going to save the prosecuting attorney a ton of time because there's not going to be a trial. So evidence, evidentiary process, evidentiary preservation, um, all those things go out the window because you're not going to ever have a trial, so you don't have to worry about that. Exactly, and my uh, and my point is is that uh, somebody uh, in the uh, chain of command had to have foreknowledge of we're going to bury this this way, and to heck with everybody. And we're not going to do a uh, full, proper investigation. Yeah, and I the think preservation that... of evidence. If you destroy Paddock's body, but you make the accusation that Paddock is the, was the sole shooter, which we know at this point we know that's not true. If you if you make that uh, 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 identify that as being good enough, uh, even though it's not good enough, uh, and you know it's not good enough, uh, then the foreknowledge starts somewhere and ends with the cremation of the body. But the bo- And, and uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, another thing is, is that the attorneys for the victims, uh, they must have had some kind of input here uh, they must have, uh, you know, and we, and I don't know, I mean, maybe you can enlighten me, but they must have known that they need to preserve all of the evidence and yet all of the evidence was not preserved and it was over within a month. Well, that's, yeah. And that's an interesting, um, interesting observation. I, I and I spoke about this in my uh, my video that I did yesterday. But, you know, the, the irony of this whole thing is, is that because there are plaintiffs, um, uh, class action plaintiffs that are the victims, they're suing uh, MGM. Ironically, they need the narrative to be true, because if not that doesn't make MGM culpable or Mandalay Bay culpable. And what I'm saying is, is that they are, they're going, they're suing MGM and, and Mandalay Bay and they're basically claiming um, negligence, which means that criminal negligence. No, no civil, civil negligence. negligence. Yeah. Okay. Cause there's so two, there, two different yeah. kinds. Yeah. And they're, and uh, well, so criminal would need to be brought by the, uh, by the prosecuting attorney in uh, in Clark County, and you know, hell will freeze over before that would ever happen. Sure, but but what what they're what they what the the situation that they're faced with is that for the plaintiffs to prevail against MGM, the narrative has to be true because they can't prove negligence um, if other 
you know, there were other shooters. So they want you, Paddock. You, uh, d- uh, uh, I'm sorry. Do you mean the current narrative as presented by the officials? Yeah. I mean, that's the irony of, of the whole thing, because the the plaintiffs are going to go into court and they're going to say, OK, Mandalay Bay, you allowed him to bring in all these weapons. You allowed him to, um, you know, create an environment where he could just sit up there in the 32nd floor and shoot out that window and kill all these people. So, you know, your maids didn't catch this. Your room service people didn't catch this. Your bell captains and bellhops didn't catch this. You all helped him. Your bell captain, your bellhops uh, helped him bring in all these weapons. You didn't check. There was no check done on the on the bags that he brought in. There was no count made on the bags. And if there was, you didn't, you know, it didn't raise a red flag that you say, wait a minute, you know, why are you bringing in 20 bags here or whatever the count was? So, so ironically in this whole thing, you're not going to see the plaintiffs challenge the narrative because they need the narrative to be true for them to be able to prevail in court. Civilly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right. So uh, the destruction of evidence at this point helps them. Well, in, in essence, although, you know, they're not going to, that's that, that part of it is not really going to ever be challenged. They're not going to challenge whether Paddock was the shooter or not. They need that to be the ca- the case. They're not going to, they're not going to challenge that whatsoever. They wouldn't challenge that at all. Now, you know, ironically, again, the defense uh, you know, the defense could raise issues where, well, and they're, they're not, of course, but they could raise issues where they could say, well, you know, there were other shooters. Uh, there were other shooters that were there. Um, they're not going to do that, of course, but it would be, boy, that would just be really. Because they need the evidence to be true. Uh, right. As, as it stands. Right. Exactly. So, so, and so, and so if the, if there was some kind of covert operation, involved in this and we know there was more more than one location where shooting was occurring on that strip at that time um uh the uh where am i going here i'm 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 trying to say that uh the uh the clandestine services uh and the um the uh officiating um, uh, constabulary, the FBI, because this is uh, a federal case, is it not? So, yeah. Uh, um, or they federalized it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they are more than happy to let Mandalay Bay and their insurance company hang out to dry. Well, yeah, and then that 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 takes us into the federal case where Mandalay Bay or MGM, Live Nation, and CSC, uh, who was providing the, the security for the venue, filed a case where the, are the plaintiffs in a federal case citing the uh, uh, Security Act of 2002 where uh, they have limited liability. So you've got two different things at play here, and it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out because the the Security Act of 2002 says that if you are a company who has been certified by DHS, which CSC, uh, who ha- uh, who provided uh, security at the concert, and those those guys are all over the world. Okay, they're the guys who do the NFL and the NBA, and you know they're the guys with the yellow jackets with the security on the back. Okay, <clears throat> so if they're DHS certified, which they are. That means if it's, there was a terrorist event where they were they were charged with the security and there was a terrorist event that occurred, they are limited in liability to whatever their insurance coverage would be. The caveat to that, which is interesting, is that the DHS secretary has to declare the event a terrorist event. As far as I know, that has not occurred. The FBI and the LVMPD initially has said that it no, it wasn't a terrorist attack because if you recall, ISIS immediately took credit for it. The, they were questioned. Uh, they, meaning LVMPD and the FBI, were questioned in the initial press conferences whether there was any connection to ISIS, whether there, this was terrorism, and they they denied it. 
Now, they have started to back off of that a little bit, saying, well, it's, you know, it's not our determination. We're not going to be the ones to determine that. So they've, they've sort of backed off of that now because since this lawsuit have been, has been filed, there have been some studious people who have actually looked it up and realized that the DHS secretary has to declare this a terrorist event for this, this Safety Act of 2002 to apply. As far as I know, that hasn't happened. So uh, in reality, it doesn't matter whether Joe Lombardo, the sheriff of LVMPD, says it's a terrorist act or not doesn't matter whether Aaron Rouse of the FBI says it's a terrorist act or not. It has to be the DHS secretary that has to declare it a, 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 a terrorist act. So, you know, I'm kind of waiting here to see whether sometime down the road the DHS secretary is going to come out after the uh, FBI completes their investigation or releases their report and says, well, OK, we looked at this and after all, it is a terrorist act. So that's, you know, that's kind of the thing that we're waiting for. But I mean, you know, the 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 gall of of MGM to to sue the victims, they sued a thousand victims. I mean, this is just unbelievable to me. They have uh, they have listed in their suit one thousand victims. Yes. Yes. So, um, well, obviously, you know, uh, uh, the best uh, defense is a strong offense. Right. So, yes. So that's that 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 is the strategy there. Um, and ironically, ironically, Scott, in their annual report, are you there? <laughs> yeah, in their in their annual report. For MGM, they put two pages in their annual report. Addressing the October first shooting, I think is what the uh, I think is what the wording is, and they indicated that they were comfortable or they were confident that their liability would be limited to their uh, insurance, um, their insurance coverage, and they even added the caveat that to the in, to the shareholders that don't worry, guys, even the costs of the litigation in other words the attorney fees would be covered by the insurance also so it's it's just unbelievable so basically you know, so basically where where we're sitting here is that um, the plaintiff uh, has every uh, every intention of letting this hang on Mandalay Bay and the subsequent services and the insurance liabilities that are in place that have been paid for by these uh, corporate entities. And uh, the uh, clandestine services, which were, uh, to, to, uh, to, to speak to the forensics uh, that we did in our nine-part uh, nine, uh, bullet point series or whatever, uh, the clandestine services uh, are more than happy to let that just sit there the way it is and the clandestine services that were most probably involved um, uh, are more than happy to let Mandalay Bay and their insurance companies and the companies that were uh, culpable in this uh, uh, scenario, in that civil suit, more than happy to let them just hang out to dry. Well, you know, essentially, I mean, the, the reality is, is that the casinos run Vegas. Uh, exactly, but and, and and the next point then then becomes, um, let's say we paid for uh, uh, we went uh, we you know our companies went out there and you know hired uh, fifteen twenty forensic investigators and then found concrete evidence that uh, there was uh, more than one shooter involved and that. Uh, uh, we had uh, absolute proof of that. Uh, somebody would have to sue somebody in the federal government for not having provided this, or uh, uh, there would have to be a criminal legal modality going on here in order to make the real story stick. Yeah, I mean that's that's a <laughs> you you just described the biggest can of worms that 
people could even conceive. Well, I mean, we know that the clandestine services uh, in this country are rotten to the core. I mean, they're rotten to the core. They're corrupt up and down the chain, and it starts at the top. Are there good people in these clandestine services? Yes. But they are under non-disclosure agreements. They talk. They could wind up dead the way this government operates. Yeah, dead in addition to being fired first and losing their pensions. That's correct. <clears throat> so uh, we're at a, at a point where um, in this particular instance of this mass shooting, um, even though uh, we could most probably prove if we spent, say, $50,000, $100,000, $200,000 on an investigation uh, that would expose the clandestine services for what their actions were and who in the clandestine services, there would be no justice done. Because somebody would have to file the suit, and that would cost a, quite a bit of money. Right. I mean, just just filing the suit. I mean, can you imagine uh, which law office would have the Gaderim, you know, <laughs> the guts to file that suit on behalf of the people versus uh, uh, the federal government? Because yeah. that that those are the parties to the suit: the people versus the government. Right. Because the government is the one that has the contracted entities inside the administrative state of the executive that is culpable for this. And we know they're culpable for this, but that suit will never come forward because nobody's going to pay for it. Uh, yeah, that's that's reality probably, although we're going to get to the bottom of it, so we're going to be... Um, working diligently and we're, and 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 very hard on trying to figure this all out because um, we're working for the victims. That's that's who our that's 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 who our well, uh, clients that. are. I, that I know we're doing. We're doing that for the victims. That I know. But um, it, you know, uh, uh, there would still and, have to be the people versus. Versus the federal government of the United States of America, in order to stop this kind of activity from happening in in the first place or in the future. Right, right, and that's you know I I mean I think we we have several levels of victims here, and that's the victims who lost family members and friends, the victims who who were wounded and survived and could be, uh you know uh, well could be I. I uh, let me take that out. They are going to be affected for the rest of their lives. And the, the people who were there who survived, who were not injured or wounded, are going to be affected for the rest of their lives. Yeah, they do. And, well, the, 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 the clandestine services don't care in any right. instance. Right. That any, any they, they, they tried to do uh, something. They did it. Uh, it didn't go uh, over in the um, uh, the official channels the way they expected it to go. And so we have the next operation, which was that school shooting in Florida, right. which had much more uh, political effect. And now there's, you know, uh, a million, millions of uh, young folks that are... Uh, uh, that are you know up yeah. in arms and and they they are motivated to be uh, you know the voters of record that say no more guns. Right. I mean, you know, if you remember that, that one worked. Yeah, and that that one happened, I believe, on Tuesday in in Parkland, the shooting in Florida. And I was it Thursday or Friday of the same week that they were in Trump's office, crying for gun control. Oh yeah. And and. And if you 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 contrast that, how many months? Uh, you know, I don't re remember the the, the timeline. Uh, how many months was it that uh, Parkland uh, a after that shooting in Parkland occurred after Vegas? I want to say look it up. four or five. Yeah, within you uh, it was on. Was it? Was it? I think it was Valentine's Day, if I'm not mistaken. Parkland shooting date. Let me let me look that up. But I mean, this is just you know. Uh, on the surface of it, uh, they're insulting. They're insulting the people of the United States. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, Las Vegas happened October 1st. They did two weeks of press conferences and October 13th. It was basically, that was the last one. I mean, it was basically shut down after that. Nothing yeah, to see here. Seen, move uh, along. Uh, the, the, the next shooting that we're really aware of is this latest shooting of uh, the gamer. Mm -hmm. uh, but that wasn't uh, uh, nearly on the same scale. No. Yeah, it occurred on, uh, uh, according to uh, the uh, Stoneman Douglas High School shooting that occurred on February 14th, 2018. So roughly uh, it was October 1st. Four months. So Four, yeah, four and a half months. You know, and and so uh, the first one didn't have the effect, but the second one had the effect they were looking for. As far as they're concerned, uh, right now there's enough of that, and obviously all of the attention that's being given uh, to the people, uh, the community of people that are uh, you know posting videos and doing their own work to try and get to the facts uh, regarding the truth of this matter. Um, uh, has uh, created a scenario where possibly these clandestine authorities saying, "Okay, that's enough. We better uh, we better bury the operations for a while until everybody starts to forget this, so that we can do this again." Yeah, I mean, it, you you you've got with with Las Vegas, you've got quote unquote the the biggest mass shooting in the history of the United States. Yet two weeks later, the whole thing went dark. The whole thing went dark. And, uh, you know, I can tell you why. Very, quite simply, something went wrong. Okay. Right. And I mean, so, that's, what we said, that's what we said in our bullet yeah. point series. I mean, that's yeah. the, the premise that we're operating from. It didn't go as planned. Yeah. And they don't want anybody looking into it. We, we don't want anybody to look into it because, uh, you know, somebody may figure it out. And if they figure it out and blow the whistle, then, then they're going to have problems. Well, that's... That's where we come in. And and we can't, uh, and, and uh, again, to recap, uh, we can't uh, test uh, any uh, for any gunpowder at this particular point in time uh, uh, that matches the paddock. We, we don't have other bodies of other shooters. There were, uh, as you reported in one of the uh, bullet point series, uh, there were, uh, you say, 15 to 20 bad guys in this. Yeah, I... From what we can discern off the the inf information that they have put out, which is censored and redacted and, you know, e everything else, I would say we're probably looking at, and, and it could be more, we, this is just a ballpark, probably somewhere between, we know the low number is five and probably the high number that we can tell is 20. And right. it could very well be more than that. Right. So, I mean, the whole <clears throat> strip, the whole strip, uh, 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 we can say was the crime scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It wasn't just the Mandalay Bay. Although, you know, Scott, one of the interesting things that we've discovered going through the body cams and the video or the, yeah, the videos, the body cams, the audio recordings is there was a there was a casualty collection point at Mandalay Bay. Right. And it wasn't for people inside the venue and it wasn't for Stephen Paddock. It was casualties that that occurred inside the Mandalay Bay. Shootings on the first floor, on the fourth floor, the 29th floor, the 32nd floor, and uh, the upper floors uh, in the Four Seasons. So there were several floors of shootings inside the Mandalay Bay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is uh, this is basically uh, uh, there's no question, you know. Uh, I can't stand the um, the uh, the inventory of phrases that is used to dismiss proper forensic investigation. Um, you know, we hear conspiracy theory. As soon as you use the word conspiracy, the next thing you know, everybody's you know the, 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 that clicks a switch in everybody's mind, uh, and it uh, leads them down a whole different. Uh, uh, a path of conversation and verb of thought, and it's just uh, incredible uh, how the uh, minds of uh, many people have been programmed in, the, in this regard, but there's no question that as a result of well over a thousand hours of proper forensic investigation that a conspiracy did occur. It's not a theory. Yeah, exactly, and you know, you and I lived through the 
the nomenclature, when that nomenclature was created, and it was created after the Kennedy assassination to try to debunk the quote unquote conspiracy theorists, the the tinfoil hat wearers. You know, there are, we, I uh, I have uh, witnessed uh, uh, certain uh, commentators on the web that uh, I, I consider reliable or on uh, national radio uh, say that uh, the CIA. Uh, is directly involved for uh, uh, injecting that particular uh, uh, term and terminology or verb of thought into uh, the mainstream. You're, well, you're, you're exactly right, because that has been uh, discovered in some releases, in document releases that have occurred in the years after that, that so, that is exactly the correct, that's right, they, so, they were so, directed. And, and so here we are... Uh, uh, you know, we haven't had a legitimate government since November 22nd of 1963. Uh, there's a lot of people that did not live through that. So they don't know what the United States was before 1963 and after 1963. Uh, and, and the way the country has uh, changed in this regard. Uh, uh, the, the other thing is, is that uh, what we have here is we have an entire federal apparatus, quote unquote, the security apparatus of, of this country, and one of the primary agencies in, in that security apparatus under the uh, 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 quote unquote Department of Homeland Security, the CIA is a criminal enterprise. And yet, Nobody wants to uh, disband the CIA. Yeah, I mean, I think we this can hold. This is a problem. Yeah. yeah. This is a yeah. problem. Uh, so, you know, we have uh, a, a criminal organization that, and, and this stuff with uh, the latest with uh, the current president. I mean, the, the, the former directors and, and people involved in this apparatus lied to Congress and they weren't prosecuted. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, who, who's who, nobody's minding the store. And so uh, uh, the dirt has to be brought out on these people. OK, so the next update uh, we're waiting for uh, is the. Um, at the end of the year, the FBI is going to release uh, their final uh, version of all of this. Is that correct? Yeah, and it's been kind of uh, unclear what they're what they're going to address. Um, Aaron Rouse, the special agent in charge of of Las Vegas, has indicated that um, they're going to do. I believe they it's B A U behavioral analysis unit has been looking at this. They have sent people all over the world to 20 different countries and and all this kind of stuff. So I think probably what we're going to see is more of the psych profile, if you will, of Stephen Paddock, which is going to just be interesting because we have taken a deep dive on Stephen Paddock and his family, and we're going to be releasing those those uh, results of those investigations um, once we get on uh, on Patreon. And it's completely different, completely different than what they have been uh, touting um, officially. So it's going to be very interesting to see what the FBI comes up with, because, you know, one of the things the the, the myriad of questions that they've fired at Lombardo have to do with 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 motive. OK. And, of course, as you know, motive in a criminal case, you don't have to prove motive to, to get a conviction. Well, uh, because Stephen Paddock isn't alive, the motive is not it's not even relevant at this point. But people are asking why, 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 why? Because this guy does not profile as a mass murderer. And the, and the reason for that is, is because he's probably well, he's not a mass murderer and he wasn't a mass murderer. So well, it's somehow going to be he is sheep dip. I mean. Uh, you know, he did do something. Uh, there were, uh, there. I mean, there are, there is video of this man carting an awful lot of stuff into the Mandalay Bay. So somehow or another, something was going through, uh, going through this man's mind. He was animated somewhere, but we can never know the truth about this. 
This has been completely glossed over. So well, yeah, you, you know, I, I, basically this is this is this has been swept under the rug, and uh, we will never know everything that needs to be known in order to get and make the clandestine services and the operatives that were directly involved with interacting with uh, Paddock, because there obviously is some interaction going on here, because that's the way they do things. Uh, they did, I mean, this is, they did the same thing with Saran Saran. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous uh, uh, what what the CIA and, and the uh, operations of this nature within the administrative state of the federal government has been doing for, for a long time. So, you know, there is criminals running our security, and we know this, and we're and 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 nobody in Congress uh, or the Senate is doing anything about disbanding, uh, especially that agency, the CIA. They're criminals. There are criminals in that organization. Alan Dulles was proven to be a criminal. Uh, you know, this goes back to Kennedy. I mean, there were when we have criminals running the government. We can't expect the criminals to turn themselves in. It's just right. that simple. So we're going to wrap this one up, um, uh, and we will. What's our next update about this going to be? We're uh, waiting for the FBI at the end of the year, and that's it. Well, or are we going to have further update after this? W- what we have, we we've, we've sort of gone dark for a couple of months, only because we. Uh, they've been the court ordered evidence releases started about four months ago, uh, about a month ago, the PIO for for Las Vegas uh, Metro said that we've got probably five or six more releases. Then a week later, when they released the final report, Lombardo was asked that in the press conference and he said, well, maybe two or three more releases. We've actually had, I believe, four releases since that press conference. So we really don't know how many more releases we're going to have as far as the evidence goes. But once that's finished, then we're going to start putting up our our videos uh, and go from there. So uh, that's that's kind of the next step for us. And we, we're in the process uh, at this point right now. We've got 16 videos planned. We have one that is pretty much finished at this point. It's a 50 minute video. It's done professionally. It's just very good. Uh, we're going through the editing process now to get that one ready. Uh, and then we're going to start blasting them out. So uh, that's what's next for us. And then we're going to dive deeper into this, of course. I mean, we're, ju- we're just getting started. We're just okay. we're just getting started. So. All right. Well, that's uh, that's it for for right now. This is uh, Scott Pollock, chief editor of the Critical Post Chicago reporting, signing off with uh, the lead uh, man of the White Hats report. That is all. <laughs>